What is the child welfare system? Child welfare system is a local system which is operated at least here in LA County by LA County. LA County uh, has a system called the Department of Children and Family Services, often referred to as DCFS. You might also hear it referred to as CPS, standing for Child Protective Services. Uh, these agencies are largely run by social workers, although they interact with and have lawyers uh, that work with them uh, rather extensively. And that's because uh, the ways in which we intervene and get involved with families is really rooted in law and statute. Uh, child welfare is also a continuum of services. Not every family that comes in contact with the child welfare system will actually have their children placed in foster care. Some of these children might end up getting services, medically speaking. They might end up getting mental health support. They might end up getting su support and services through the public health department via uh, services uh, through a nurse family partnership or uh, through a public health nurse or through a child care agency. So although the child welfare system often refers to social workers and this idea of foster care, we really think about it as a continuum and as something much bigger than just um, removing and, and putting a child in foster care. Uh, in addition to being a continuum of services, the child welfare system is incredibly collaborative, uh, sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. But I will say that um, here in LA County, our child welfare system works with everyone from uh, philanthropic groups, foundations that provide with private funding, universities such as ours. We work very closely with the LA County DCFS to support their research needs. LA County DCFS also works with USC, Cal State LA, uh, universities outside of California, for instance, Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. Um, so again, universities are a big partner. Community-based groups, whether it be a nonprofit or um, an a organization providing legal aid, a group providing mental health services, parenting support, um, any kind of, uh, you know, training for parents, um, oftentimes programs called Nurse Family Partnership or Public Health Nursing will support new families. Um, there's quite an extensive list of community-based groups that support uh, child welfare system. Um, there's also many uh, agencies like WIC, uh, which provides you know, nutritional support for children and families that oftentimes work with child welfare. And of course, schools. Um, one thing that we'll touch on throughout our, our work is the role of schools uh, in the child welfare system. And that's really for a couple of reasons, both because schools are the largest reporter of child abuse and neglect, and we can talk about why that's for better or for worse uh, and how that impacts families of color. But uh, schools are oftentimes referring and, and participating in the investigation process relating to um, whether, you know, a child abuse claim is, is uh, legitimate and, and accurate. Um, schools also end up educating a number of our children. And as you'll learn later in the academy, kids in foster care have a number of needs that are often uh, underserved in the foster care system. So schools are a big part of our work, and some schools have some really great programs in place for kids in foster care. Um, there's also a number of mental health groups, substance use programs, and much more that provide services uh, to parents and provide services to children. Uh, some of you might be here and be interested in being a therapist or becoming a psychologist. Um, there's organizations throughout LA, both governmental and uh, NGOs that provide therapy and provide mental health services to families. Um, they are all really great and we hope that you'll hear about more of them throughout the academy.
So briefly, in terms of our LA County system, LA County is the largest child welfare system in the world. Uh, this is in part because of LA County's population. We are one of the largest jurisdictions in the country with over 10 million people living here in LA County alone. I was really happy to see that um, when I made these slides last year, we had quite a few more children placed in out-of-home placement, around 21,000. Um, since then, we've reduced those numbers to about 16,000 children in out-of-home placement. This means that 16,000 children are uh, currently uh, living in uh, a home other than with their biological parent, okay? So that could mean uh, a grandma, a grandpa, a niece, a nephew, um, a, excuse me, an aunt or an uncle, um, a, a neighbor. Um, and this can also mean a total stranger. So uh, somebody who is not known to the child becomes their foster parent, okay? So the arrangements uh, for, for children living in out-of-home care vary tremendously. Uh, and we can talk more about, you know, what that those arrangements often look like, but um, there are 16,000 children in foster care um, living with someone other than their biological parent. Another uh, about 8,000 or so of those kids are receiving some type of service. Um, so these are kids that are at home, or these are kids that are, um, you know, living with mom and or dad, and um, getting some type of service and support uh, with their families. Um, this can range from therapy to uh, parenting classes, substance use support, uh, any type of intervention that might help the family function and, and safely uh, stay together while they work through the challenges that they're experiencing, okay? Um, the LA County DCFS operates at a budget of about $2 billion annually. Um, this is largely to pay for the 9,000 plus employees that work at DCFS. Um, these folks, as I mentioned, include social workers, parent partners, lawyers, um, therapists, people that really keep the day-to-day -day operation of DCFS up and running. It also pays for a number of services that the children and families receive. And so, um, you know, DCFS has contracts with groups across the county that ensure services are delivered to these families. I wanna acknowledge and pause here and state that many uh, individuals and advocates, myself included, who have worked in this space and work in this space, find that Poverty is a huge issue for our families. It is oftentimes the primary issue that they are entering child welfare system because of. And so when we see something like a $2 billion budget, and then we know, wait a second, families are struggling. They can't put food on the table. They can't house themselves. They can't clothe themselves. The children need funds for activities and so forth. Like, why don't we just take some of this money that we're giving this government agency and reroute it to families in the form of, you know, guaranteed income or cash assistance? That's a big question that sort of looms over the child welfare system and has loomed over it for many years. Um, it's, it's a question that, again, we've been able to answer by way of shrinking the system, by way of providing families with more support, um, by way of pr providing families with cash assistance in some instances, but it hasn't been enough. And so as I give this talk, I really want to acknowledge that uh, while it can seem like I'm just glossing over, here's the budget, here's the staff, these are the numbers, there's a real reality that um, we need some reform, significant reform. Many people would argue we need to abolish this system across the board and change it entirely because it's clearly not working or serving families. And as David will get into shortly, it's impacting families of color in a particularly harmful way. Okay, I'm here to tell you the, both the reality of what we are dealing with, what things are like, 
And as we go through the talk, we'll also talk about the ways in which we'd like to see things change. Okay. And part of that change will come in the form of legislative reform, advocacy, and through many of you. And that's why we're so happy that you're here to participate so that you can learn and think about entering this space and bringing the change to it that it needs. All right. Brittany, thank you for catching the questions. If I've missed a question that anybody puts in the chat, Brittany, feel free to flag me or y'all can just um, talk and I'll be happy to answer you as I go, okay? Any questions so far? All right, I'm gonna keep going then, but feel free to pause me if needed, okay? Oops. Sorry, I'm not used to working in Canva. Okay, let's go. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk now a little bit about this idea of you know the continuum of quote care. Some people would refer to it as a continuum of harm or as a continuum of, of challenge for our families. And I, I really wanna be mindful and attentive to that. Uh, primary prevention is something that we talk a lot about at the Pritzker Center, and, and this really refers to the idea that we can and should stop maltreatment and stop child abuse and neglect and stop and curtail the issues that impact families and result in their involvement in child welfare before they happen. Okay, and I would also argue here that primary prevention really refers to the idea that we should look at families through a lens of cultural competency, cultural sensitivity, and really through the understanding that many families are doing the very best that they have with what they have, and that it's their circumstances and you know, years and generations on generations of trauma and suffering that have brought them to this place now. And if provided with proper support, they could and should avoid child welfare, okay? Um, can anybody think of some examples of, of prevention or ways in which we could support families to help them avoid child welfare? Can speak out or put it in the chat. Absolutely, universal health care. Absolutely, thanks, Sebastian. Home visiting, definitely. Is it? How do you say your name? Is it Soyan? Soy, Soyan. I Soyan. Hi, Soyan. Thank you. Yes, Hi. home visit is a great idea. Thank you. Any others? Parenting classes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Providing families with infant care and support, formula and diapers, definitely. Anything else? Paid family leave, absolutely. All right, so these are some great suggestions. Uh, certainly other items to consider would be child care, Yes, thanks, Danielle. Um, child, yes, thanks, Tori. We were we we're reading each other's minds. So certainly child care. Absolutely, Mia's talking about, you know, mental health and its relationship to uh healthcare generally. Um, yes, nurse family partnership. All of these are great ideas and just go to show the uh tremendous expertise of you know the students here in this group. And, you know, in many instances, these programs are preventing families from, from involving themselves in child welfare, um, but they're not enough. And they're certainly not widely available in the ways in which they should be for families to meaningfully and avoid child welfare. Uh, Tori's talking about affordable housing, which is such a critical piece and creates such a stressor for families that really ends up you know, breaking down and, and causing other stressors, right? We can't afford housing, so we can't afford food, so we can't afford childcare, so we can't afford the bus to get to work, and so we can't afford anything at all. Uh, so thanks, Tori, for raising that, okay? So again, primary prevention, and this is really for all of us to be thinking about. When we're hearing things like child tax credit, universal healthcare, um, you know, improving schools, uh, 
thinking about the ways in which we invest in drug treatment, all of these things that, you know, when you hear or see the president on TV or you hear or see Governor Newsom on TV, you won't necessarily hear them say, by doing this, we could help families avoid foster care. But it's often the case, as I mentioned earlier, that by doing these things and creating a stronger, a stronger social safety net for families, that they will in turn avoid foster care. Okay, so I, I just want to uh, help us really understand the roots of um, how we can help families. Okay, so next we. We'll talk a little bit about how the system responds to families. Uh, I wanna start by sharing that the standard under California law for making a report of child abuse or neglect is a reasonable suspicion of child abuse or neglect. When I say the word reasonable, what does that bring to mind? What kind of standard are we thinking about? Feel free to add in the chat what, what that could mean. Yeah, it's a legal standard of reasonableness, uh, Austin. It's open to interpretation, that's right. But is this like a gut feeling? Is this something that you have facts to base it on? So really what we're looking for is some type of factual basis that gives us a reasonable suspicion of child abuse or neglect. What kind of facts might give us that suspicion? Feel free to add in the chat. Bruises at school, bruises, bruises, yes. Any others? Sorry about this. Yeah, affect, they're there's malnutrition, emotional distress, child's not paying attention in class. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have appropriate clothing. Absolutely. Behavioral problems, okay. So these are all really great ideas. Now, if I were to say, if I were to, if I'm a teacher and one of my kids shows up to class without a jacket, let's just say, and it's snowing outside, we're living in New York and it's snowing outside, um, is my first response to call Child welfare? Or is there something else I could do? Yeah, ask follow-up questions. What what might I do? Any ideas? Maybe ask the child, um, oh, what happened to your jacket? You know, it's pretty chilly outside. And they might respond, oh, I forgot it. Oh, my mom forgot to pack it. We were rushing this morning. Or in the cases that it may be child like neglect, it could be, oh, my mom didn't want me to bring a sweater with me today or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Clarissa. So folks are being really mindful of the fact that just because a child shows up without their jacket doesn't mean that mom is mom or dad is neglecting them or whoever the caregiver might be, grandma, grandpa, auntie, right? Um, it might just be that they forgot. Um, but then, you know, other students are raising, maybe talking to the child and getting a good, a good sense for whether it would be okay to contact the parents. It might not be safe, okay? Um, maybe it would bring up more issues for the child. Sometimes we see that children who are forgetful, they can then get in a lot of trouble with their parents for being forgetful, which creates more problems for them, okay? So it's really taking a nuanced and one-on-one -on -one approach. But this standard, this reasonable suspicion of child abuse or neglect is really what 
tips the process off or kicks the process off, excuse me, um, in terms of a phone call being made to the child abuse hotline. Okay. You can imagine, and I shared this earlier, a lot of times these calls um, uh, are made by teachers because they are the ones interacting with children in schools. There's a great movement afoot to uh, shift this practice of mandatory reporting to a new practice of quote, mandatory supporting, which might take the form of some of the things that students are sharing in the chat around, you know, checking in with the family, getting them a jacket, checking in with the child, you know, finding out, you know, why, maybe why they forgot the jacket um, and what could be done to be more supportive as opposed to just, oh, Johnny didn't bring his jacket to school again. I'm going to call DCFS. Okay. So uh, again, the reasonable suspicion of abuse or neglect is what kicks off the process. Um, there's many other fact patterns that could come up that would result in that call, but typically the school is the first site of intervention. Uh, assuming that a call is being made about something, you know, more serious. Let's use the example of bruises. Um, a call to the hotline will be made and then an investigation will ensue. That investigation is performed by the Department of Children and Family Services and their social workers. The investigation can involve visiting the home, uh, making the child go to a doctor's appointment, um, having the uh, child medically evaluated, um, doing an interview with somebody that is trained in forensic interviewing to better understand how the child uh, sustained the injuries. It might involve talking with neighbors with, um, quote, collaterals, so other people who actually work with or are involved with the family, okay? Um, let's say the child also plays sports, so it might involve talking to the child's uh, coach and seeing um mom saying the child got the bruises at soccer. Um, is there any reason to believe that the bruises happened at soccer coach or could it have happened elsewhere? You know, just again, digging in and getting more information. A child can be either removed before that investigation if there are uh, certain circumstances that are met, uh, meaning that it's a more severe situation or the child can remain in the home while the investigation takes place. Uh, it depends, again, on the circumstances. Um, you can imagine that in a situation where we think we can remedy the situation by providing some support or services, the child may be able to stay at home. If there is a drug raid or there is something like physical or sexual abuse happening, it's more likely um, to uh, result in a removal, okay? And uh, again, once the child is removed, they will be placed uh, either with a relative who is safe uh, and appropriate for the child, or they will be placed with a non-relative, either emergency foster placement or with a licensed foster parent, okay? Um, those, uh, those placements are approved through a government process um, which we won't spend a lot of time talking about here, but I will acknowledge that there are efforts underway to address um, the licensing standards that relatives in particular have to uh, meet in order to have a child placed with them. Often what we find is that in communities of color and among relatives in particular, they may have criminal background uh, issues that prevent a child being placed with them. And for many of these folks, those background issues happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. And now this person is a grandma. They want to take care of, you know, their, their grandchild and are being told, oh, you know, no, you can't. Um, in, you know, 1972, you had a shoplifting issue, uh, issue. Um, and we know that, again, communities of color are over surveilled, over um, policed, and oftentimes have these criminal issues because of that over surveillance and that over policing. And therefore, when it comes time to take care of their kin, their grandchildren, their nieces, their nephews, they're told they can't, which then results in the child being placed in the care of a stranger. And so there's a real effort in the placement space to address some of these issues. 
so that families can stay together, even if not the biological parent, but at least biological family members, okay? There's a court process that takes place known as the detention hearing. This is when the court will officially decide whether the child should remain in foster care or be returned to the parents. Assuming the child is detained, the family will most likely receive reunification services. Those reunification services must be targeted at the reason for removal. So let's just say the child was removed because the family experiences substance use issues. The, the reunification services therefore must be targeted at substance use issues, okay? Um, and they must receive uh, opportunities to visit with their children and again, uh, attend classes or get other support with the substance use issue. Uh, in the course of reunification, the child will stay with their foster family or their relative caregiver. And while they are doing that, um, these kids are often moved to a new school, to a new community. They may be separated from their siblings. So there's a lot of hardship that can take place within that reunification period within the foster care system while it purports and attempts to do good to bring the family back together. When we talk with young people who were in foster care, one of the biggest challenges that they face is the separation from their family, their community, their siblings, their pets, their belongings. And so again, I want to emphasize that for everything that I say that sounds like, hmm, that sounds reasonable, that sounds like something that should be done, there's also a tremendous amount of hardship challenge that's taking place and often being carried on the backs of very young kids while their parents try to get the support that they need to be reunified with them, okay? Uh, assuming that the child is reunified with their parents, about 50% of those children will re-enter foster care. They, that means that they will uh, come back into foster care for a subsequent issue. It could be the same thing. So going back to my substance use example, the family is experiencing substance use issues. They go through substance use uh, training and, and therapies and so forth. They reunify and then there's a relapse and then the child reenters foster care, okay? Older children, what, especially those that re-enter are more likely to have challenges uh, with placement, with um, what we'll refer to as permanency, which is the fancier word for adoption or legal guardianship. And so you can imagine that cycle of re-entering foster care, returning back to the parents, being removed again. It creates a lot of disruption for families and especially for the children. For children that are in foster care and cannot reunify with their parents, they will more than likely be placed for adoption, which we'll talk about later in the academy, or they will go into a legal guardianship. Both of these options are considered permanent placements. And if reunification is not possible, permanency is the hopeful alternative. There are, however, a number of children, particularly those that enter and re-enter and become older within the foster care system, and particularly among Black boys, that will not find permanency. These are oftentimes kids that also start running into challenges with our juvenile justice system. So these are kids that, because of the trauma that they're experiencing, because of the disrupted attachment issues that they're experiencing, they... they will have a diff more difficult time with finding a permanent placement and will quote, age out or emancipate from foster care, having never lived with a permanent family besides their own biological family, okay? Um, and again, this is something we could talk about, like I could make an entire course like on that alone, but I'm just trying to give you the, the overview. Oh, there's a B. Um, so 
Extended foster care, again, refers to the option for young people who uh, enter foster care, do not find permanency, they turn 18, and then remain in the foster care system. Uh, well, they then remain in the foster care system and can receive support and services until they're 21, okay? This is a very brief overview of a process that for many families can take one to two years just to work through. And for some children can involve their entire lives. We've certainly met children that entered care when they were a baby and then at age 18, they're still involved with child welfare. So I have in about three to four minutes talked about something that can take years to work through. So again, this is just a brief overview. I have a question, Taylor. Yeah. Um, you mentioned 50% of foster care youth will return after reunifications. Has this figure changed throughout the years or has it remained kind of constant? Yeah, thanks for asking, Waldo. It's so nice to meet you. Uh, so it's about the same um, and it's been the same. Um, there's certainly been efforts over the years to uh, reduce what they call recidivism um, by way of you know, ensuring that the services that are being provided are high quality and actually really supportive to families and actually remedying the reasons for, for entering foster care in the first place. But we nevertheless continue to see the recidivism. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I wanna answer your question, Tori, about the hotline reporting. Um, Calls can certainly be made anonymously to the hotline. Uh, in many instances, they're made by teachers and others with by providing full information. Um, and if you have more questions about the hotline, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, Marcos is asking about undocumented parents. So Marcos, we have had in the past a uh, speaker talk about immigration and its relationship to the child welfare system. Unfortunately, that speaker was not available this year. However, we can give you the link to um, the talk from last year and uh, you could watch it there and learn about that issue there. Um, and then there's also a really great um, lawyer. Her name is Lindsay Toflowski, I wanna say. Uh, and she actually works at the intersection of child welfare and immigration quite extensively. And if you want to talk more about that, just let me know and we can, okay? But um, I will say that for undocumented parents, um, DCFS does not have a relationship or role in reporting these families to ICE or to immigration um, and undocumented families receive the same support and services um, as do uh, resident or citizen families. Um, and again, there's no relationship between child welfare and immigration. Although, as you can imagine, in an immigration matter that may be pending before the immigration court, any issues concerning child welfare can be very concerning to the court with respect to, um, you know, uh, working through the citizenship process. So it can become very complicated. And like I said, I'm happy to talk more about it, either in office hours via email or directing you to last year's talk on that issue. We're sorry that we won't be talking about it here. Brittany? Yeah, just double checking, who was the um, speaker for the immigration? It would be Andrea Ramos. Okay. And she would have talked during the special issues talk. Gotcha. Thank you, Brittany. Okay. All right, David, I'm taking over your time. I apologize. I do have a couple more slides um, and I'm gonna just briefly go over them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a number of partners that work in this space. Um, many of them are listed here. I want to um, reiterate the role of community-based groups and certainly faith-based groups. One of the things that we found is that when it comes to working with families of color in particular, that faith-based groups can be wonderful and supportive partners um, with everything from providing you know, families with rides and support that they need to meals, um, housing, uh, 
and oftentimes placement options. Um, so again, just want to mention that. And then I also want to mention um, the uh, the role of um, our public agencies. Um, certainly libraries and schools can be a great outlet and support for children and families. Um, and also the role of tribes. Um, there is a small number of children um, who are uh, of Indian heritage in our child welfare system here in LA County, but in other more rural jurisdictions, particularly those in Central California, in the Northern part of the state, there are quite a few children that have, um, that are part of tribes that are um, Native American and that um, necessarily partner with the tribes in order to facilitate um, the child welfare system's involvement with their families. Um, we're not going to talk at length about the Indian Child Welfare Act or what's often referred to as ICWA, uh, but again, um, want to highlight that in any case involving uh, uh, a family, one of the first issues that we address is whether the child is of Indian heritage, and if so, their case follows a different trajectory and a different path in order to engage the tribe and their family and their family's uh, situation. Okay. Sorry with the slides. Whoa, you guys, I am sorry, I am not clicking properly. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, juvenile justice also becomes an issue in our child welfare system. Um, these are kids that we refer to as crossover or dual status youth. Uh, these are often kids that start by having uh, behavioral issues. And in my opinion, in my experience, the behavior often stems from a tremendous degree of suffering, a tremendous degree of hurt, a lifetime of trauma, um, a lifetime of you know, inattention to what the child really needed. And that could be both in their home of origin or it could be once they were removed and placed in foster care, and it could be because they were removed and placed in foster care. Uh, for many kids who um, are having behavioral issues, unfortunately, whether it be at school or in the community, juvenile justice will find their way, its way into their lives um, through, through a alleged criminal act. So the, the child is in possession of a substance, the child is selling a substance, uh, the child is not attending school and uh, shoplifting, uh, the child is uh, engaged in a more serious criminal act, okay? Um, and all of these issues um, can result in their involvement in juvenile justice system. Um, when I've worked in the juvenile justice system, uh, we've seen that over two thirds of the kids that are incarcerated are also kids that were in foster care. So it's easy to bifurcate or separate uh, these two populations of kids, although in my experience, they are the same. And for that reason, there's a movement and a, you know, a lot of advocacy uh, that any child who comes into contact with law enforcement um, should be able to access child welfare support as opposed to entering uh, and becoming incarcerated. Uh, we also know that girls um, are about one fourth of our cases in juvenile justice, um, but over half of them have contact with child welfare. So if you're interacting with kids in juvenile hall and it's a girl, more than likely uh, she is uh, someone who um, is, uh, has had some have excuse me has had experience with uh, child welfare. I want to also acknowledge that I've been referring to boys and referring to girls here. Um, certainly, a number of our children and and that we work with in child welfare um, identify as non-binary, identify as um, LGBTQ plus, um, and that's an area that uh, Ariel will address um, later on in the talk or excuse me, later on in the academy, um, but it's certainly an issue that we are mindful of and that comes up uh, among our older kids uh, quite frequently and is something that um, is very important to uh, pay attention to. So 
just briefly, and then I'm going to turn it over to David, um, a number of common findings among our kids in care. Like I've been saying, disproportionality is a big issue with African American and Native children overrepresented in our foster care system. Here in LA, about 33% of kids in foster care are African American, but they make up a smaller portion of the child population, about 15%. Um, we are doing some work on this uh, issue through a strategy known as blind removal at the UCLA Pritzker Center. You can Google that, read about it in the LA Times if you wish. Uh, there is also a great film, which I'm not going to show you in the interest of time, called Dawnland, which talks very specifically about the harms that Native American families have experienced uh, in the child welfare system. It is super moving. I highly suggest it. It's on PBS and you can, we'll send out the slides and you can find the link there. Um, as I just mentioned, um, a number of LGBTQ youth are involved in child welfare and um, it's again, an important issue to focus on, pay attention to and understand, particularly if you are working with older youth, um, that this is something to be mindful of. I've talked about this briefly, but educational outcomes are um, unfortunately uh, quite uh, dark among our, our kids in care, both with, with respect to high school graduation, all the way up through college. Um, and Jill Rowland will talk more about that uh, next week. And uh, healthcare uh, is again, a major issue impacting uh, kids in foster care, both in terms of mental health, dental care, as well as their physical health. Um, oftentimes given a family circumstances, health issues have been neglected, not, not um, paid attention to. And then because of the abuse or neglect that the child experiences on top of the trauma that they've endured, um, their health can be very poor. And this is why it's incredibly important, particularly for those who are interested in medical care and serving um, you know, underserved children and families, um, to be mindful that if you've got a child in foster care as a patient, chances are they have some pretty serious health issues that need to be addressed, okay? And lastly, this is one of my favorite quotes and I always share it, um, especially when it concerns talking about foster care um, because it can seem really dark, it can seem unfortunate, it can seem really challenging. And yet there's so much that we can do and there's so many ways in which we can do it. All of us, whether it be as a lawyer, as a doctor, as a nurse, as a teacher, as a therapist, as a social worker, as a public health worker, as a business professional, can reach out and reach out to children and families involved in child welfare and do something to support them. Um, some of us will have never experienced the things that kids and families go through in the foster care system, but we can reach out and try to help them in the ways in which we can. All right, so I, I wanna leave us on a high note of feeling optimistic and also with my reflection that there's no better space to work than with our kids and families um, when it comes to observing some of the most resilient and hopeful people you will ever come across in your career, okay? So with that, my talk will end. I will turn it over to David and we'll take about a four minute break 205, we'll come back and talk with David. David, is that okay with you? Yeah, that works for me. Great. So students, feel free to take a break, get a sip of water, use the restroom, et cetera, and we'll be back to start at 205. Thank you all. David, how's it going? No, it's going okay. I'm getting over COVID right now. So oh, no! <laughs> Yeah, not great. Um, so I'm hoping my voice lasts through the presentation. We'll, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, but otherwise, things are good. Oh, you sound great. Well, I'm sorry to hear you got COVID. Bummer. Yeah, it's going around. <laughs> <gasps> so I hear. Okay. Yeah. Great. How are well, you doing? Thanks for still doing this. I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. We're, we're happy to be here and grateful for your time. Of course. Um, and really eager to learn from you. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm, I'm gonna give you, I'm sorry, David, for going over time. No, don't worry. I'll, I'll definitely be under, I think I'll be around 
40 minutes. That's my guess. So we'll have time for questions and maybe we'll even wrap up early. Super. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Um, Brittany, I'm going to put these slides um, in the drive. Okay. And you can uh, distribute them from there if you'd like. Okay. I'll do that. Hi, David. Just wanted to say I hope you feel better and it's nice seeing you here from the Alliance. <laughs> hey, Gabriella. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's good seeing you too. I noticed you and also Caroline. Caroline, right? yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah. Both, we're both on David's policy team, so it's exciting seeing you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually, I was supposed to do a similar presentation, I guess it was last week, on Wednesday. Yeah, so that's been rescheduled for... Monday, and I think it'll have it'll have a lot of the same content, but it'll be a little different. So I don't know. I mean, it could be worth attending. I know you guys don't you don't have to go to any of the talks, right? Um, I'm not sure, but I was planning on attending. Okay, it, it's the one that you and Sabrina are presenting, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I think it'll be interesting for you to see because. Sabrina is also going to do an overview of the dependency system, so you can compare that to what Tina presented. I guess Sabrina's will be far more in depth than what I did in forty minutes. No, I think it's just going to be a different, different presentation. But um, but Taylor, I was going to say I really like. I feel like you have like a very balanced and fair perspective on the child welfare system. Yeah, just just based on what I know of child welfare system, which isn't as much as you know. So, <laughs> I know quite a bit, and your expertise is incredibly valuable. Um, and I do think that, you know, the more we can tie it to issues concerning race and marginalization of families, the the more accurate we can be, because uh, it's it's very linked. Okay. All right. Everybody, welcome back. I'm going to turn it to David now. And uh, just in the course of doing so, I want to thank him. David Noble is a dear friend, an incredible, incredible mind in this space and doing so much to really link the um, you know, link our understanding of child welfare to the historical uh, marginalization of Black uh, Native American and other families of color. Um, and so I'm really happy we have him today. He is a gem and thank you, David, for your time. Uh, we, we would not be able to do this without you. So thank you, thank you. We'll turn it to you now. I'm gonna let you share and make you co-host. Okay, do you think you could actually move my slides forward for me? Would you mind? I totally can. I think I just need them if I'm gonna okay. do that. Right. Yeah, I did. I emailed them to you, but it was it was earlier today. So oh, I see them. Twelve eighteen. Yeah. Let's put these babies on the screen. Thank you so much. I'm oh, sorry for the welcome. short notes. Um, you, you asked me this already, and I forgot. <laughs> well, thanks so much for the uh, lovely introduction. Yes. Um, you go. All right. So. Yes, yeah, so I just want to thank Taylor and the Pritzker Center for having me here. Um, the Pritzker Center is a, you know, a really close partner of the Alliance for Children's Rights. I work for the Alliance. I'm on the policy team there. Um, and so we have two of our summer interns here, Gabriella and Caroline. Um, so that was, it was really exciting to see both of you all in the Zoom room. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Alliance is a legal services and policy advocacy organization based here in LA. And we do local advocacy here in LA County, as well as legislative advocacy at the state level. And I'll discuss some of that work at the end of my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the goals of this presentation, and I'll try to keep it somewhat loose. Um, so the, the goals are to examine the history and present day impacts of racism and bias in the child welfare system, and also to learn about some ongoing reform efforts. And I just wanna quickly make a note about language. So 
when I'm referring to people of color and communities of color in this context, I'm specifically referring to the Black, Native American, and Latino families and communities that, that have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by the child welfare system. And so I'm gonna be throwing a lot of information at you. So if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and I'll pause as I go through. And also I, I was saying to Taylor just now, maybe you all heard I'm getting over COVID. So my voice is a little weak and I hope, you know, I hope that you can still hear me clearly. Um, please let me know if that changes. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna prevent, present a brief overview of the history of racism and discrimination in the child welfare system. And this is actually history that I was first introduced to by Dr. Jessica Price, who is a close partner of the Prisker Center. Um, the overview I'm gonna give is, it's not comprehensive, but it should hopefully deepen your understanding of why the child welfare system looks the way it does today. And as I go through this presentation, particularly towards the end, I think you'll really see a lot of overlap between what I'm talking about and what Taylor is talking about in terms of you know, the, the impacts of poverty on child welfare involvement, you know, the issues of race, class, all those things. Um, but to begin with, if you want to think about government surveillance and destruction of black families in the United States, you have to start with the institution of slavery, which arguably laid the foundation for the child welfare disparities that we see today. Under slavery, enslaved parents had no rights to their children and enslaved children had no rights to their parents. Family members could be separated at a moment's notice, never to see each other again, and that happened countless times. And I also wanna note the particular sexualized violence that was experienced by enslaved women who, as a result of rape and forced breeding, were forced to give birth to children who also became enslaved. And when I think about this history and its legacy today, I'm reminded of a TED talk that was given by Brian Stevenson, who's the, a famous civil rights lawyer, who I imagine some of you have heard of. Brian Stevenson runs the Equal Justice Initiative, which is working to end the use of the death penalty in the United States, among other initiatives. And so Stevenson, he gave a TED talk, I think it was about, it might've been about 10 years ago. And so he was talking about this lecture that he gave in Germany. And he was talking about, you know, his organization's work to end the death penalty in the US. And at the end of the lecture, this German woman stood up and said to him, we can never have the death penalty in Germany. There's no way with our history, we could ever engage in the systematic killing of human beings. And this German woman was of course referring to the Holocaust. And I'm not bringing up this anecdote to compare today's child welfare system to the Holocaust or to slavery. But what I'm trying to argue is that you can't separate our country's troubling history from our present. And in trying to address the racial disparities in child welfare today, there's an opportunity to write a historic wrong. Next slide, please. So moving on from the era of slavery, going to the latter stages of the, of the 19th century, there was a rapid increase in the number of orphanages around the country. And that was in part to house children who were orphaned by the Civil War. And this was also the beginning of the era of legal segregation in the, in the South, known as Jim Crow. In the South and also in other places in the United States, most orphanages were segregated by race. And according to Dr. Jessica Price's research, the orphanages that house Black children tended to have substandard facilities and resources, and they tended to focus on training the black children there to be servants and typically servants in the homes of white people. Next slide, please. So while discussing the roots of racism and child welfare, we also have to look at the government's deliberate and often successful attempts to subvert Native American cultural and family traditions by separating Native children from their families and sending them to boarding schools. And this is something that you may have heard of. It's been in the news lately, um, the history of the Indian boarding school movement. So I'll just you know, briefly touch on, on this history. The first Indian boarding schools were founded in the 1860s with the mission of quote unquote, civilizing native children by teaching them English and converting them to Christianity. 
For the first few decades of the Indian boarding school movement, the schools were located on tribal lands. But then in the 1880s, reformers decided that if they wanted to truly assimilate Native children into mainstream white culture, it would be most effective to separate them from their families and then place them in boarding schools that were off reservation. And in, this, in the quotation that's on this slide, Native journalist Mary Annette Pember, she describes what life was like for the tens of thousands of Native children who were sent to these institutions. And I quote, students were stripped of all things associated with Native life. Their long hair, a source of pride for many Native peoples, was cut short, usually into identical bowl haircuts. Students were physically punished for speaking their Native languages. Contact with family and community members was discouraged or forbidden altogether. The quote continues, survivors have described a culture of pervasive physical and sexual abuse at the schools. Food and medical attention was often, were often scarce. Many students died. Um, and related to this quote, earlier this year, the Federal Department of the Interior, they put out this landmark report detailing the ugly history of Indian boarding schools in the US. And according to the report, the Department of the Interior ha had identified 53 marked and unmarked burial grounds on school sites where American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian children were sent. Often families weren't even told when their children had died. This federal report, it's, it's viewed as like this landmark acknowledgement of the federal government's involvement in Indian boarding schools, which is of course like, it's an, of course an important step as a um, truth telling exercise, but you compare the release of this report to what's being done to what's being done in Canada, where earlier this year, the Canadian government reached a $31.5 billion settlement to compensate Indigenous families impacted by the country's child welfare system. So I think we'll see where how things unfold um, with potential um, reparations for Indian communities impacted by the child welfare system and then boarding schools, but I, I'm not holding my breath, unfortunately. Um, and also, I also want to note that it wasn't until the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act, which Taylor mentioned earlier, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't until the passage of that act that Native parents were given the legal means to prevent their children from being sent to boarding schools. Next slide, please. The Indian boarding school movement, like slavery, was actively supported by the federal government. And in the early 20th century, the federal government began to take a more leading role in the formal child welfare system that primarily served white children. And around this time, so the early 1900s, the public opinion was turning against orphanages, which were seen as cold and overly institutional. And at, there was this conference at the White House in 1909 it was called the, Con the Conference on the Care of Dependent Children. And the attendees of this conference, they put out a statement at the end of it, and they declared that children should not be removed from their homes except for urgent and compelling reasons, and destitution was not one of those reasons. So this quote is significant because a group of, a group of child welfare experts were saying more than a century ago that it was wrong to separate children from their parents simply because a family was impoverished. Nevertheless, as Taylor was saying, poverty is one, of the, is one of the main reasons why children are separated from their parents today and placed into foster care. During the Great Depression, so a couple of decades after that conference at the White House, the federal government created the Aid to Dependent Children Program, later renamed Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC. And this program provided direct cash aid to widowed mothers and single mothers living in poverty. So AFDC was mostly funded by the federal government, but state agencies were in charge of actually administering benefits. And in the Jim Crow South, welfare agencies created rules that allowed them to arbitrarily deny benefits to black mothers and black families broadly. For example, welfare workers could deem a household, quote unquote, unsuitable if the worker determined that the children had been born out of wedlock or that a man who wasn't the, ch the child's parent was living in the home. And so obviously like you had state agencies making value judgments about black parents' fitness 
and then using those judgments to, de to deny them the services that they needed. And in 1960, in what became known as the Louisiana incident, the state of Louisiana expelled 23,000 children from its welfare rolls based on the judgment that their households were unsuitable. Most of these children were black. And there was a public outcry that followed the Louisiana incident. And after this public outcry, um, the federal government instituted a rule that said that states couldn't deny benefits or services to families simply based on this unsuitability judgment. The rule was named the Fleming Rule after Arthur Fleming, who was the head of the department that administered AFDC at that time. And after the institution of the Fleming Rule, an increasing number of black mothers were able to receive welfare benefits. Next slide, please. While the Fleming Rule reduced some of the, some of the discrimination in the administration of, child, of welfare benefits, it was also the first in a series of policy reforms during the 1960s that led to more children of color being placed in foster care. According to the Fleming Rule and other federal policy changes that followed, state child welfare agencies, they could no longer ignore the needs of children living in what were deemed to be neglectful or, or abusive households. Instead, welfare workers had to either provide services that would allow the children to remain safely in the home, or the, the workers would recommend that the children be removed from the home and placed with relatives in foster care. For the first time in history, states received federal funding to place children in foster care and also to, prov to provide financial benefits and services to foster caregivers. On the other hand, states weren't reimbursed for providing in-home services to birth parents. So what you can see here is that there was a financial benefit or a financial incentive rather for agencies to remove children from the home and place them in foster care. And we still see this dynamic today in the way that federal funds for, for child welfare are dispersed. Um, one more thing I want to note about these federal policy changes in the 60s was that the states were also required by law to, repo to report neglectful or abusive parents to the court system. And these two developments, emphasizing the removal of children and reporting parents to the courts, they were significant because those elements of the child welfare process remain disproportionately harmful to children and families of color today, even though in theory, these practices are aimed at protecting children. Next slide, please. In 1974, Congress passed the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, known as CAPTA. CAPTA made it so that states had to follow certain guidelines for mandatory reporting laws in order to receive federal funding to address child abuse. And I saw there was a question during Taylor's presentation about, um, I think it was about anonymous reporting. Um, and so what I want to note here is that the system of mandatory reporting was really developed in the late 60s, early 1970s, and then solidified through the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. And so when mandatory reporting laws were first instituted in the late 1960s, it was just, it was just healthcare workers who were, who were mandated to report suspe uh, suspected abuse. But then with the passage of CAPTA, states widen the net of mandatory reporters to include teachers, social workers, and law enforcement. So essentially you had more eyes on children and more people, or not necessarily more eyes on children, but more people who were mandated by law to report their suspicions of abuse and neglect. And not surprisingly, the number of maltreatment reports skyrocketed. Between 1974 and 1980, the number of maltreatment reports nationwide rose from 60,000 to 1.1 million, and the number of foster care placements rose as well. But initially, the federal and state governments didn't view the increase in maltreatment reports and foster care placements as a reason to invest more resources in prevention, which you know Taylor was talking about before, preventing children from entering the system in the, in the first place, right? Um, and so another notable piece of child welfare legislation from the 70s I want to mention here is the Indian Child Welfare Act, known as ICWA. Um, so during the congressional testimony 
which led to the passage of ICWA, it was revealed that between 25 and 35 percent of Native children in the United States were being separated from their parents and placed outside of their families and communities by child welfare agencies. And 80 percent of these children were being placed in white households. Many of these children were, were removed from their parents simply because their families were living in poverty. And as we all know, poverty experienced by indigenous communities is a direct result of government actions over hundreds of years, right? And so ICWA was designed to create strong legal safeguards against the needless separation of native families and all the related traumas. Broadly speaking, what the legislation did was that it gave it, um, put it in law that tribal courts are best situated to make child welfare decisions involving native children and also that child welfare agencies must make what are known as active efforts to keep native families together and place native children with relatives or other community members. With the passage of ICWA, as I mentioned before, native parents won the legal right to prevent their children from being placed in off reservation boarding schools. Next slide, please. And before I move on to uh, some present day um, impacts of racism and bias in child welfare, I just wanna mention two more pieces of federal legislation. The Adoption Assistant and Child, and Child Welfare Act of 1980, it did include language about prevention. And I think that was a response to the large increase in the federal foster care caseload. Um, but, this legislation also created the first federal subsidies encouraging the adoption of children from foster care. So there you see a financial incentive to move children out of the system through adoption versus really strengthening this strengthening supports to prevent children from being separated from their families in the first place. And then the following decade, the Ad Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997, known as ASPA, um, it made it easier for courts to terminate uh, parents' rights and make children eligible for adoption. So one thing that I wanna note here is that both of these changes, you know, this focus on, or not, you, both of, this, of these pieces of legislation and also this focus on adoption, it was happening around the same time that more and more black children were entering foster care as a result of the over-policing and over-incarceration that characterized the war on drugs. And I'm just going to pause here. I did not see any questions. Um, so I'll take that as a um, directed to continue. Next slide, please. So let's look at some racial disproportionality and disparities today. I, I do think that Taylor went over some of this data, um, but I figured I'd go over it anyway, just to kind of hammer the point home. So just, just to clarify terminology, disproportionality refers to a group's overrepresentation within the child welfare population compared to their share of the overall child population. And then disparity refers to a difference in outcome at a certain stage of the child welfare process. For example, Black children who are alleged to have been neglected or abused by their parent or caregiver are more likely to have that allegation substantiated by a child welfare agency than white children are. And I'll discuss that specific disparity in more detail later. So let's look at some of this data. In the United States, and this, I have the California data on this slide, but I'll, I'll also talk about the nationwide data. So in the US as a whole, Black children comprise 14% of all children, but 23% of children in foster care, and more than half of Black children in the United States experience a child welfare investigation before the age of 18. Despite the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act more than 40 years ago, the proportion of Native American children in foster care is 2.6 times higher than their share of the total child population. And while Latino children are underrepresented in the national foster care population, they're overrepresented in more than 20 states. When you look at the back end of the system, meaning how children leave foster care, children of color are less likely than white children to exit the system through reunification, adoption, or legal guardianship. And this is especially concerning because 
children who age out of foster care, meaning they never find a permanent home, are more likely to end up homeless or incarcerated. In California specifically, black children are nearly three times as likely as white children to be referred for maltreatment, are more than three times as likely to have a maltreatment allegation substantiated, and are four times as likely to enter care. And in terms of Native American children in California, compared to white children, they're more than twice as likely to be referred for maltreatment, two and a half times as likely to have a maltreatment allegation substantiated, and more than three times as likely to enter foster care. And there's some LA County specific data that I have, but what you need to know is that the disparities are deep and very troubling. Next slide, please. So how do we make sense of these data? Um, Taylor talks about the impact of poverty on child welfare involvement. So I just wanna to return to that point. Um, as I was mentioning before, the formal child welfare system was built to support needy children and their families. And today, certain communities of color experience much higher rates of poverty than their white peers. According to a 2020 report by the Children's Defense Fund, here are some child, here, here are the child poverty rates in America. 30.1% for black children, 29.1% for Native American children, 23.7% for Hispanic children, and 8.9% for white children. So children belonging to these minority groups experience poverty at two to three times the rate of white children. And as we know, income and wealth inequality in the US is not an accident. For centuries, our federal, state, and local governments have enacted, pol have have enacted laws and policies that have restricted opportunities for employment and educational attainment for communities of color. Further, that, that's, not even to men that's not to mention inequities in healthcare access, housing, public safety, and many other areas. So that's all to say that poverty is a creation in this country. Um, but, does that mean that the disproportionate impacts of poverty are the sole ex is the sole explanation for the racial inequities in the child welfare system? The information I present next will really suggest otherwise. So even before low-income families of color come into contact with the child welfare system, they're under the surveillance of professionals in other systems, such as social services, healthcare, education, criminal justice, who are mandated by law to report suspicions of child abuse or neglect. Further, racism, racism and bias in those other systems feed directly into the disparities in the child welfare system. For example, let's consider what we know about racism and policing and criminal justice. Between 1986 and 1991, so that's at the height of the crack cocaine crisis, the number of black women incarcerated for drug offenses rose 828%. And so that's, a, that's according to a paper by Dorothy Roberts, who's a leading um, scholar on racism and child welfare and other related systems. And so I just wanna say that again. In a five year period, the number of black women in prison for mostly nonviolent drug offenses jumps more than 800%. And based on recent data, it's fair to assume that around a third of these women were mothers and the primary caretakers for their children. So as a direct result of over-policing and over-incarceration, tens of thousands of black children around the country ended up in foster care. And this phenomenon continues today, though to a less severe degree. And this is a moment where I think we can just stop and think about the historical pattern of devaluing the black family and devaluing black motherhood. So at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about slavery and the family separation that, it, that occurred within that institution, as well as the sexualized violence that black women experienced, that enslaved black women experienced. And then in the first half of the 20th century, black families were arbitrarily denied welfare benefits in the Jim Crow South. And then in the second half of the 20th century, you have the criminal justice system and, child, and the child welfare system combining, in a sense, or colluding, however you want to put it, to separate Black families rather than provide them with tangible financial support or 
you know, effective substance, tre- substance abuse treatment or other services. And even putting aside inequities in other systems, when low-income families of color are investigated for neglect or abuse, decades of research and personal testimony show that the child welfare system treats families of color differently from white families. In other words, biases held by people working within the system show up in their decision making. And on this point, I just want to mention a 2008 study that looked at data from Texas. And what the study found was that after controlling for income and risk, Black children were 77% more likely than white children to be removed from their homes instead of receiving in-home services. And another way to put this is that caseworkers determined that a white child and a Black child were at equal risk of future maltreatment, but they were more likely to remove that black child. And I think that, you know, that study is just one of many that, you know, really points to biases within decision-making inside the child welfare process. Next slide, please. And I see a comment about longitudinal data to see how the poverty rates have changed after the legislation. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I can think I can, you know, I'm, I'm gonna follow up with you at the end of this presentation to um, find out exactly what you mean. Um, so before I wrap up the section on poverty and the child welfare system, so I just wanna discuss some of the implications of federal policies on poverty rates which may actually relate to your comment. Um, So the implications of federal policies on poverty rates, as well as child maltreatment. So in the first section of the training, I was talking about a federal cash assistance program called Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC. During the 1960s, thanks in large part to the welfare rights movement, a growing number of black families were able to receive AFDC benefits. But around the same time, there was a conservative backlash against anti-poverty programs such as AFDC. And this backlash really, it began to coalesce in the 1960s and then culminated in the 1996 welfare reform bill that was passed under President Bill Clinton. This bill eliminated AFDC, which was an entitlement program and replaced it with temporary assistance to needy families, which is a block grant. The funding level for TANF has been frozen since 1997, which means that its value in inflation adjusted dollars has shrunk 40%. Under TANF, states can impose work requirements to, to limit eligibility for benefits. And today, black children are more likely to live in states, many of them in the South, where TANF has all but disappeared, meaning that less than 10% of low-income families receive benefits. And compare that number to the 1970s, when over 80% of poor families with children received AFDC benefits. Now, compare what's happened with TANF over the last 25 years to the Earned Income Tax Credit, or EITC, which I imagine some of you have heard of. There was a study published, I believe it was at the end of last year. Um, I can put a link to it in the chat. Um, so it was, it was a, published by researchers at the University of Washington. And what they found was that a 10% increase in the state version of the earned income tax credit for low to moderate income working families led to a 9% drop in the annual number of child maltreatment referrals over a 14 year period. So that's kind of a mouthful, which is why I'll put the link in the chat right now. But what the study showed was that as EITC benefits rose, depending on state policy changes, maltreatment reports and specifically child neglect reports declined. So what this study and the data on TANF really underline is that as a country, we make deliberate political decisions that not only allow families to languish in poverty, but also increase the risk of reported child maltreatment. Next slide, please. 
So that was a lot of that history, background information, context. I hope that, you know, it uh, wasn't too convoluted and that it really kind of, kind of connects the dots in terms of understanding how this country intervened in the, in the lives of black families, Native American families, Latino families, you know, later in history and what the impacts of various policy decisions have been over time. Um, and so given the current landscape of the child welfare system, the Alliance, the organization I work for, we've organized a coalition of, a coalition of legal services and advocacy organizations to advance a set of policy reforms to address the racial inequities that I've discussed here. And this coalition and the, can and the related campaign is called Whole Families, Whole Communities. And the vision for this campaign is as follows. All families will have equitable access to services and supports, regardless of their socioeconomic background, race, or ethnicity. And as a result, no child will be at greater risk of entering or aging out of foster care based on these characteristics. And so I think what this vision tries to communicate is that the socioeconomic issues that feed into the disparities in the child welfare system, the, ch the child welfare system cannot solve these problems alone, but there are reforms within the system itself that can at least make the system function in a fairer and more equitable way so that you don't have community family, you know, children of color entering the system at a, at a greater rate than white children or not receiving the services and supports that they need to actually stabilize um, and remain with their parents. So with the help of Taylor and the Pritzker Center and other partners of ours, the Alliance published a report last year that covers the history that I discussed and the present day data and policy implications. And that also includes a set of policy recommendations that we believe would help achieve the vision that's on this slide. And I'll put a link to that report in the chat. Um, next slide, please. And since putting out this report, the Alliance, our partners, and other organizations in LA and California, we've been working to turn some of these policy recommendations into reality. And I'm just gonna go through a few of these examples. So the first one I wanna talk about is Senate Bill 354, which the Alliance co-sponsored last year. Um, and Taylor actually re referenced um, some of the issues that led to this legislation, including the fact that there's, there's, a, there's an approval process for relatives and non-relatives who want to be caregivers for children who are separated from their parents, right? And that approval process is called resource family approval. And it includes a criminal history review for the potential caregivers. And because of <clears throat> because of you know the, the realities of over policing and over incarceration, there what um, our partners and I have encountered in our work is that there there are a lot of caregivers of color who have these old arrests um, and convictions that have no bearing on their ability to care for a child today, but that have interfered with their ability to be approved as um, a resource parent. And so what Senate Bill 354 did, and I also want to mention um, some of our other partners, including the Children's Law Center and the Free Coalition, which really represents um, people affected by the criminal justice system. So this group got together to move forward this bill that, that aimed to reduce some of the barriers to relative placements. And specifically, it broadened the list of convic convictions that qualify for exemptions. And so that means that like, there are more people today who, if they want to step up, step up as caregivers, but have criminal backgrounds, those backgrounds can qualify for exemptions. Um, and then the bill also, it waives some of the income requirements when it's appropriate and empowers child welfare agencies to support relatives in access, accessing supplies such as cribs, car seats, and booster seats. And then I also want to mention Senate Bill 1085, which is 
it's being sponsored by this organization called A New Way of Life. Um, and they specifically are supporting um, formerly incarcerated people who, whose children were placed in foster care. Um, and so what this bill aims to do, it's moving through the legislative process right now, is that it's rede redefining neglect, like child neglect in the statute, so that there are protections for parents experiencing poverty. Because right now, within statute, there's a lot of um, subjectivity in how the law can be interpreted. And as we've you know, said time and again, a large majority of the families who end up in the child welfare system are end up there because of issues related to poverty. Um, so we'll see if Senate Bill 1085 passes, um, but it would be really exciting to, for California law to really, um, to include that language that specifically references poverty as a reason not to separate a child from their parents. And then I also want to mention the blind removal pilot, which is happening now in LA County. And Taylor said she didn't want to get go into too much detail about this. And so I, I won't either. Um, but I think what I want to note is that the basic idea of blind removal is that you try to take bias, racial bias out of the decision making process so that when a child welfare agency is deciding whether to remove a child from their parent or not, the people making that decision don't have information about race, zip code, or anything else that could like trigger any any of any biases they may hold. Um, and so, LA County is currently um, <clears throat> is currently implementing a blind removal pilot. And then another partner of ours, the Children's Law Center, they are running a bill right now that would establish a blind removal pilot throughout the state. And so it's, um, I, I will acknowledge that some of the blind removal is a new strategy and the data is somewhat mixed in terms of like how much it's able to re reduce disparities in terms of kids entering care, but it does show a lot of promise as a way to address some of the racial disparities that we see in the system that, that we've seen for so long. And then lastly, before I wrap up, I want to mention a group called the Reimagined Child Safety Coalition. And so this is a, an advocacy coalition that was started by members of Black Lives Matter LA during the, um, the protest summer of 2020. And what Reimagined Child Safety a lot of people in this coalition, which I sometimes participate in, they consider themselves to be child welfare abolitionists. And through this coalition, they're really trying to chart a path to, um, I guess, yeah, chart a path towards abolishing the child welfare system in LA County. But along that path, they have put forward a list of demands um, that they put, they put forward this list of demands to the county in order to address some of the racism and bias in the system. Um, and one of those demands is to end any sort of partnerships between DCFS and law enforcement, because there are really upsetting, there have been some really upsetting situations when law enforcement had gotten involved in child welfare investigations and traumatized families. And then another one that uh, I just want to briefly mention is that the coalition was one of the organizations that helped pass this board motion in LA County about, I think it was about six weeks ago, to develop a pre-petition legal representation pilot in the county. And just for those of you who don't know, pre-petition representation refers to legal representation provided to families before a petition is filed in court to separate, to put that child in foster care, right? And so the idea is that if families are able to avail themsel themselves of legal services very early on in the child welfare process, then they can know, their, know what their due process rights are, 
have their due process rights protected by an attorney, and then also get support for whatever issues led to that child welfare investigation in the first place. And so this is, I think, one of the most critical reforms that needs to be implemented in order to make the system more equitable and just. And so it's really exciting that the county is at least moving forward with looking at the feasibility of a pre-petition model in LA County. Um, and with that, I will stop talking. So please let me know if you have any questions. Marcos, go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you for coming and talking to us about this. It's very important. Um, and I'm Marcos and I'm part of the MDMPH program. And a couple questions. Um, first one is when you're talking about these upcoming bills and kind of figuring out whether, you know, the court determines whether a relative is fit or not. Does this differ when we're talking about guardianship, which usually occurs to like a probate court versus uh, going through the fossil foster care system? Is there a different way of how we figure out or determine if a relative or non-relative is uh, capable and taking care of the child? So the resource family, you're asking if like there's a separate court system? I guess more does it matter, I guess is there a different way for them to determine I guess our, our relatives or parents held to different standards if it's going through guardianship versus adoption because guardianship is not permanent. You know, the parents still retain those rights uh, versus adoption, it's a more permanent, um, it's a more permanent uh, discontinuation of those rights. So I guess, is there a different, I guess, I don't know how to say, explain it, but yeah, I think I get what you're asking. And so Taylor, please jump in if I misstate this, but I think there are different processes. So resource family approval, that process is just for the child to be placed with a relative. It doesn't necessarily lead to a guardianship or an adoption. Theor theoretically it could, but those are like separate legal processes. This is just for, let's say you have an emergency removal where a child is removed from their home even before there's a court hearing, right? So resource family approval or, or that specific legislation has to do with placements that, that may be temporary in the end. Um, and there, I mean, it, it gets complicated with guardianship and adoption because you can also get a guardianship in the probate system, which is different from the dependency system where child welfare cases are processed. Um, and one issue, and this is actually a good question because one issue that the Alliance is working on um, is called hidden foster care. And essentially our, our understanding of hidden foster care is that you have a situation where there's a child welfare investigation and instead of filing a petition in court for that child to be removed through the dependency system, right? The child welfare worker goes to a relative and says, this is, this, this is the situation. We don't want you to have to go through the foster care system. So we want you, you can take this child and seek a guardianship through the probate system. But the problem is that, or one problem, depending on how you look at it, is that if that relative gets a guardianship through the probate system, then they don't have access to any of the supports and services that are available through the child welfare system. Um, so I hope that answers some of your question. You'll definitely like learn more about adoption and perhaps also guardianship later in the academy. Thank you, appreciate it. Sure thing. Uh, thank you, David. I had a question um, about AFDC. I was wondering if you could elaborate on why that was replaced and maybe the specific role of racism in that replacement? Sure. Um, so as I was talking, I was talking about before, um, so AFDC, it was a, it was a block grant, right? So, uh, or an entitlement, an, an entitlement grant rather, right? Which meant that like, if you were 
um, eligible for, then you would receive it. But from the 60s onward, it was port- like, so AFDC was welfare, right? And so it was portrayed as something that went to poor black people who were abusing the system, you know, not working hard enough. There was like that depiction of the quote unquote welfare queen who, and that was really prominent in um, Ronald Reagan's governmental gubernatorial campaign. And so for decades, there were, there was this, um, there were these media portrayals of welfare benefits as going to undeserving black people who are abusing the system. Right. And so what Bill Clinton's welfare reform bill did was it turned it into a block grant, meaning the funding was limited. And then it added all these requirements to make people, to make more and more people, or rather it, it added these requirements, these work requirements that made it so that states could deny benefits to people. And as time has gone on, as time has progressed since that um, welfare reform bill was passed, fewer and fewer people have received um, have received TANF. And so I think, my, like my understanding of the you know the racism in the transition from AFTC to TANF was that conservatives successfully portrayed it as a you know as something that went to black people living on the government's dime, and then changed. AFDC into something that was increasingly um, less available to people who needed it, including low-income white people. Thank you, David. That was very, very helpful. Any other questions? Okay. David, thank you so much. That was extraordinary. We, as always, appreciate you and all the insight that you can lend us. We are very grateful. Let's all give David a Zoom round of applause for the great presentation. And before we close, I just want to, again, inquire, are there any further questions for today or for the remainder of our program. Oh, thank you, Angelica. So uh, we're, Angelica is asking about attendance. Um, so Brittany is tracking attendance just based on, on the Zoom screen. Uh, in the past, we've had like, during the height of COVID, far more students participating. So it was a little harder to track, but this time we're just going to track based on the on the folks here in the room. So she's got that down, right, Brittany? Yeah, I take it about halfway through just to like let people trickle in, so yeah. So, so we're good with that, Angelica. Thank you for the reminder. And again, any other questions? So Brittany, or actually David, do you, are we able to share your slides with this group? Yeah, absolutely. And also I have, um, I've been putting together like a resource list so I can share that with you too, just with like a lot of the studies and other things I was referencing. So, Great, thank yeah. you, David. So Brittany will send out my slides, David's slides and the, uh, resource list that David just mentioned. My slides have some videos in them that you could click on and watch if you'd like to do that as well. And then uh, also be reminded that in the syllabus, there's a number of links that you're uh, welcome to peruse that uh, elaborate on and um, dive deeper into many of the topics that we've discussed today. With that, we will see you tomorrow at office hours, should you like to join us at 3 p.m. Or if not, we will see you on Thursday for our session with Dr. Langley and Dr. Wong. We look forward to spending more time together. And if you need anything, please do reach out. Thank you all for being here today. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.